It was 1878, and James Riddy was on a ship headed for Europe. A saloon owner from Dayton, Ohio, Riddy was excited for his trip abroad. Little did he know that it was actually something already on the ship that would have the most impact on his life. Back home, Riddy had issues with some employees stealing money, but it was hard for him to prove it and even harder to know exactly how much had been stolen. While on the boat, Riddy saw a machine that counted the number of times that the ship's propeller completed a revolution. An obsession took hold. Could he use that same technology to track his sales? Five years later, and countless hours and dollars invested, Riddy had finally done it. He called his invention Riddy's Incorruptible Cashier. It was the first cash register ever made. Riddy quickly patented it and set up a business eager to share his creation with the world. But the business fell flat. There was little enthusiasm for the device among business owners. No one could understand why they needed it. It was a failure of marketing, and almost as soon as the company opened, Riddy had to close its doors. In 1884, John Patterson came across a description of Riddy's design. He was intrigued and bought both the patent and the company off of Riddy. Patterson renamed the company to the National Cash Register Company, or NCR. Where Riddy failed to turn a profit, Patterson turned the company into a massive global success. For more than 130 years, NCR has been a household name. In a world packed with competition and constant innovation, a company with staying power like that is notable. The ability to stay relevant is rare, and the ability to figure out how to stay relevant is even more elusive. The pace of change of these new technologies is something I think organizations really struggle to get to. And then the biggest issue usually is success. The organizations that are successful to reinvent themselves generally have to destroy a little bit of themselves. And do you have the leadership and the courage to be able to do that? That's Ismail Amla, the executive vice president of professional services of NCR and a modern day John Patterson. Ismail is helping shepherd NCR into a period of growth through an ever shifting socioeconomic landscape. Today, NCR is worth more than $5 billion, works with organizations like Chipotle, Starbucks, and others across various industries, and has expanded way beyond cash registers. So how is Ismail helping bring NCR's 130-year legacy into the modern world? And how has the company continued to stay at the cutting edge all these years? Find out on Business X Factors. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, Vice President of Media Strategy at Mission.org, and this is Business X Factors. Each week, we'll take a look at the secret sauce that takes companies to the highest levels of success and then unpack how they actually got there. We'll explore how these organizations are run, what's so special about the people, culture, and processes that make it all happen. Question for you. What do you think is the best use of technology? Our friends at Highland believe technology is about transforming the way we all work so we can be more informed, empowered, and connected through every interaction and in every relationship with everyone we serve. Highland is your X factor for better performance. Go to highland.com forward slash insights to learn more. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D dot com slash insights. NCR acts as an intermediary for hundreds of thousands of transactions a day. It sits at a cross-section in consumers' daily lives and has an opportunity with each transaction to have an impact. This is a position Ismail has personally been familiar with since he was a kid. He saw firsthand the value in being able to step in between a person and a problem. I was the first born. My parents were immigrants from India. 
the very interesting thing was my father was one of the few from India who spoke English. So he became the de facto community relations officer. And I remember it was fascinating because this idea of service, of having a skill that helps others, and the fact that everybody is the same, trying to make a good living, protect their family, and get further in life. So for me, it was quite foundational in terms of some of the values I think I was brought up with. Serving the underserved stood out as an important principle for Ismail. And he wanted to find a way to make an impact that was unique to his skill set. That seemed like a tall order, but that intersection between passion and opportunity arrived for Ismail when he was a teenager. And I only really put one plus one together recently when I was reading a book by Malcolm Gladwell on outliers. And he was talking about something happens in your life that really determines your trajectory. And what happened, I think, was I was was about 15, 16 years old, and my father bought me a BBC computer. Now, BBC, of course, don't do computers, but back in the day, this is 1980, they sold computers. Wow. Now, my dad is a worker in the cotton mills, so he knows nothing about computers. But for some reason, he thought this might be interesting for me. And that is what really got me hooked into programming. I did a degree when computer science wasn't cool <laughs> last century <laughs> in 1937 <laughs> with um, punched cards and so on the, all the rest of it. This need to help other people by acting in the in-between and its perfect blend with Ismail's affinity for burgeoning tech was not something that comes to fruition without a leap of faith. About 12 years ago, I got offered an opportunity to move to the US I was in the UK, I'm a level two partner at Accenture, very comfortable, and I'm thinking, why would I move? And uh, my parents reminded me that they moved from India to the UK, and they were hoping that I wasn't risk averse and had become indigenous. And they were so appalled at the fact that I was thinking of managing risk that (laughs) it forced me into into moving to Manhattan, and actually it turned out to be the best time of our lives. Taking that risk and deconstructing the world he knew would turn out to be one of the most valuable lessons Ismail had to learn. In New York, he worked at a management and technology consultancy called Capco before taking a position at IBM. Eight years later, he moved back to London where he became the chief growth officer at Capita, the UK's largest business process outsourcing and professional services company. Shortly after that, a new leap presented itself this time from the 30-year-old Capita to the 130-year-old NCR. Why, why was NCR interesting? In, in, NCR is interesting because it's going through a transformation, creates change, especially when you touch the number of people that NCR touches. If you think about how many ATMs there are in the world, how much cash is sent out, that is that many amount of people that we touch that we capture data from. So that's one data point, right? So we've got this network, probably one of the most incredible networks in the world. It touches hundreds of millions of people every day in every country. Secondly, we've then NCR then went into this point of sale uh, world, right? Which is I'm going to sell you some say, something, and I'm in the middle of that transaction. And suddenly I've got all this data coming at me around what is this individual doing with the cash that we are giving out on here? And then this individual, they're going to restaurants, they're going to a Burger King, McDonald's, spending money in entertainment. And again, we're in the middle of that transaction. And for me, when you start thinking about the consumer and creating, moving the power of the data to the individual, NCI is one of those organizations that has no vested interest in one particular industry on one particular platform, but are going to be able to join the dots to be able to give this incredible consumer power back to the consumer, where, you know, the the idea that the retailers know everything that you buy, want to buy, want to afford, the financial services organizations are the people who can give you the power to go and live that life. NCR have the data to make that magic happen. And, and for me, that's where it started getting really interesting in terms of what they've done in the past and the art of the possible in the future. Founded in 1884, 
NCR has come a long way from being a manufacturer of cash registers. It was the first to create automated teller machines, check processing systems, and barcode scanners used in modern ATMs and retail checkouts. NCR is no stranger to innovation, but Ismail is shepherding in a whole new level of ambition in terms of adapting to the market. Now, NCR sits in a very unique place in between the product and the consumer and well-placed to service both. I'm sort of a little fixated in technology should benefit the individual and the control of how it benefits should be in the hands of the individual. NCR, it's such a trusted brand, right? You're going to go and get money from it. So it's the real trusted brand. And you need to have this element of trust to be able to do what we're talking about here in terms of using data in a very responsible way. We know their financial planning probably better than they know themselves. We can give them access to financial services products. We can give them access to better retail products. And we can help the retailers and the financial services organizations be more targeted with the consumer. Because one of the things that we have, which is really unique that NCR have, is not just data on what a customer has bought, but the SKU level data. So, for example, everybody will say, I know you've been to Starbucks, therefore I'm going to send you coffee coupons. With NCR, we know whether you bought coffee or not, or whether you bought tea or a biscuit or a, something else. And so that SKU level data allows us to be very specific in specific offers to help people. This approach to data is something that has kept NCR on the front lines of a new era. So how has the company been able to achieve this level of innovation? Find out after the break. When I need help, I want someone who understands where I am now and where I'm coming from, but with a broader perspective. The folks at Highland are like that. Highland is a true partner to more than half of Fortune 100 companies, a partner that understands your industry and offers expertly tailored solutions that evolve with you. With Highland, you gain a complete view of information across your organization, along with the agility to compete at the top of your game and deliver better customer experiences. Highland is your X factor for better performance. Go to highland.com forward slash insights to learn more. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D.com slash insights. When we left, I asked what the secret sauce was to how NCR has constantly been innovating. The answer is somewhat unexpected. You have to be willing to destroy a part of yourself in order to grow into something better. I think it's the greatest challenge I've always walked into in every job that I've gone into, which is around culture, which is the mindset, the growth mindset, which says this organization, which has been successful for 150 years, to continue to be relevant to our clients, A, needs to change, but B, we can do it, right? The, the, the idea that everything is possible, we can relearn, we can develop new skills, we can increase our relevancy to our clients. And this place is no different. It's around mindset, it's around driving big culture change in different geographies. The organizations that are successful to reinvent themselves generally have to destroy a little bit of themselves. Ismail has found that this essential piece of growth is very often easier said than done, but it's always worth it. It's all about growing and creating something meaningful, something that doesn't ever become stagnant. It's an idea he literally wrote the book about with his co-author, Vivek Wadwa. It's called From Incremental to Exponential, How Large Companies Can See the Future and Rethink Innovation. You concluded that while big organizations can be dinosaurs, they can also engineer change. And you've seen massive changes in these big organizations. There's a little bit of a burning platform helps organizations to think differently and do different things. And, and even if I go back five years, most large organizations thought they had time to deal with all the changes coming at them. And then suddenly everything accelerated and suddenly pandemic happened. And I think Satya Nadella said, 
we've had five years of transformation in three months or something like that, right? So I think the burning platform question has gone away. Everybody knows to compete, you're going to have to change and technology is going to play a big part. But then there's some critical things. There is an acceptance of what power you have. And as a big organization, and this was always my conversation with Vivek, because he was saying small organizations are agile, they're smart, you can pick your talent, you can go do things big organizations can't do. And I'm saying big organizations have clients, they have channels, they have brand, they have ecosystems. There's a lot of power of incumbency that if two organizations were starting at the same time, the big organization, in my view, and we always thought about this, would have an advantage. But what bigger organizations also have is bad cultures. The idea of bad culture can be a very broad term and an even broader problem to solve. But when Ismail is talking about bad culture, he has a specific kind of bad in mind. It's cultures that are too slow, is skills that are not relevant, is resistance to change, passive or active. And I think for a big organization, you've got to think about what is it you want to do? What sort of culture do you want to create? And therefore, how are you going to incent this innovative behavior? We talk about innovation in Tesla between part one in 2006 and part two of his plan in 2016 was 10 years. So you need patience, right? This is, you know, innovation doesn't happen quickly. So I think you need patience in large organizations. If you think about Jeff Bezos and Amazon Prime, $10 billion business started with a suggestion box that he sponsored. So you need executives who sponsor change in organizations. If you think about collaboration and you think about the Apple headquarters, which is the donut is so that you are forced to walk across from people you don't know who don't work in your departments. So you need to design disruptive organization for collaboration. And so there's lots of lessons we can learn from people who've done this really well and take the advantage of the, of the incumbency to, I think, give big advantage to, to some of the larger organizations. And for these Goliath organizations, outpacing the Davids of the industry requires exponential thinking and a readiness to experiment in order to expand. If you think about exponential growth, then in today's world, you need to be a platform or part of a platform ecosystem, right? Because you need multiplier effects that is bought on by the platform where other organizations join in to your gig. And NCR have got the retail platform, they've got the hospitality platform, they've got the digital banking platform. They're also hooked into other platforms. That's one area of, I think, how you create the exponential effect. Secondly, is this idea that the best ideas won't come from one place. They won't come from HQ or one product lab. So we've got this innovation process and other organizations that do the same thing where how do you get small teams to do incredible stuff, give them the authority to go and try things out. And if it fails, it's not a disaster. We go and do something else. Modifying how you collaborate, having patience and a long-term plan, as well as giving your team the voice to offer suggestions. These changes are not easy to implement, but on the other side of this reconstruction is something much better, something stronger than what was there before. Is there a certain way where NCR has been willing to, in some ways, destroy a piece of itself in order to gain something else? We, for, for example, this idea that we want to be responsible for as a service around platform, and we used to sell hardware kit. We sell ATM machines. And every time we, we sold an ATM machine, we got a bunch of money. And we've turned that into an other service model where actually it's very painful up front, but there's a recurring revenue. You know, you can see it in our numbers. It's very painful up front, but it is focused on how do we become relevant for the long term. James Riddy couldn't see how to make a fortune off his device, but James Patterson could. Through marketing and advertising, Patterson destroyed preconceived ideas about cash counters and ushered in a new era with NCR at the forefront. And today, 130 years later, by transitioning its business model from hardware-focused to software-driven and continuing to rethink how it can better leverage data to help customers, NCR is maintaining its powerful position in the industry. And that's been NCR's legacy since day one that to be relevant requires reinvention and a true willingness 
to destroy what was old to bring in the new. I don't know about you, but when I have a decision to make, I look for information. I may look through emails, documents, photos, and files in multiple places. And if I'm lucky, I find what I'm looking for. So it's amazing to me that while I have trouble finding a single file, some organizations success hinges on making sure that the right people can get all the right information they need when and where they need it. Like hospitals, insurers, banks, and all sorts of businesses. I don't know how they do it, but our friends at Highland do. Highland empowers more than half of 2020 Fortune 100 companies with tools that help make sure the right information gets to the right folks easily and automatically and makes business processes smarter and more efficient. Highland is your X factor for better performance. Go to highland.com forward slash insights to learn more. That's H-Y-L-A-N-D dot com slash insights. You've been listening to Business X Factors, created by Mission.org and brought to you by Highland. If you like this show, please be sure you subscribe or follow us on your favorite podcast app. I'd be so grateful if you rated and reviewed this show on Apple Podcasts, as that really helps ensure that more amazing listeners like you find the show. Thanks for listening. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, and I'll catch you next time on Business X Factors.